I was on the event one, not the stage one. Wonderful. So, um, now that that's out the way, we know that I'm not talking uh, with a black screen. Uh, I am Oliver Caldwell, as uh, Primogen brilliantly introduced me. Thank you very much. Um, I'm a closure programmer from London, um, in West London, to be precise. Uh, and I'm going to be showing you how I write software as well as plugins uh, for NeoVim in an interactive way. Um, I've been calling this conversational software development for a while now, which is the title of the talk. Um, I'm hoping you'll understand why by the end of the workshop. Um, I prepared a few slides, but I, I thought it would be fun to build the slideshow plugin while presenting to you all. So this could be a huge mistake, we'll see. Um, I'm going to be uh, copying from a working version of the source because I don't want to incur the wrath of the demo gods. Um, I'm slightly worried that that will still happen, but I will try my best. Uh, so we're going to be using Conjure, uh, which is my NeoVim plugin for interactive development with uh, Clojure, Janet, and Fennel, which are programming languages if you've never heard of those names. Uh, there's more language support coming as well with like Common Lisp and Scheme on my roadmap. Um, so uh, we'll be writing the plugin in Fennel, which is a Lisp that compiles to Lua. Uh, and it can be run directly within NeoVim, as other people have mentioned during the conference. Um, writing plugins in Lua can get you a lot of performance and you don't have to touch Vim script and there's a bunch of other benefits. So uh, yeah, we're going to be writing it in Fennel, but actually it's really just a Lua plugin. Um, and a fun side note to all of this is that like Kunja is itself a Fennel based Lua plugin and I use Kunja to develop itself. So as I improve the tool, it makes it easier to improve the tool, uh, which is a fun meta loop that uh, I get to embark on. Um, right, so uh, let's get started. So hopefully everyone can see my screen and my text. I'll make that nice and big. Uh, that should be good enough. Um, and I will be copying from existing code. So I'm not writing it character by character because I have some sort of sense. Um, and what we're actually going to be outputting is to Lua. So as I mentioned, it's going to be a Lua plugin. And this looks awful, right? This is Lua, sure but we never touch this. You can think of the Lua we're going to be outputting for our plugin um, essentially as a binary output. So we never look at it. It's just a, a compilation target, if you will, like how you would compile uh, like TypeScript to JavaScript. You never really look at the JavaScript. You just look at the TypeScript. Um, so yeah, this looks awful, but that's our target. Uh, the only Vim script we're going to have is in plugin slash kkslider.vim. That's the name of my little slideshow plugin we're going to be making. Um, and that's it. That's all there is to it. We check if we have NeoVim, and then we do run some Lua where we require the kkslider.main module and run the init function from within that module. Uh, that is that is literally it. Um, like, there is no more Vim script. So everything else now, all we worry about is Fennel. Um, so I'm going to open up my Fennel file. Here it is, we have some fennel. If you've never seen a uh, list before, you're probably like, why are there so many parentheses? Oh God, make it stop, there's too many parentheses already. And don't worry, there's gonna be many, many, many more. Um, so what we're going to do uh, is show you quickly, because I have a lot more time than I thought I originally did, so I'm gonna try not to rush, um, is show you how I evaluate things uh, inside NeoVim with this sort of thing. So, uh, little mini lesson in fennel and lisps, functions, are at the front of a list. A list is denoted by parentheses. Everything after that is arguments. Okay, we're done. That's the entire language. You've just learned everything you need to know. So plus, we can treat as a function. So we want to evaluate plus. We're going to give it two arguments, 10 and 10. I'm going to run that by doing comma EE. -E. So that was evaluate my current expression. What that did was take this form, so these parentheses, um, send it into uh, Fennel, which is itself written in Lua. So it's running inside NeoVim. We have no external processes, compiled it to Lua, and then executed it as Lua within NeoVim's Lua JIT process. The result was then captured and placed inside this log buffer. And this log buffer is a history of all of my evaluations. So it's just a regular buffer, which means that I can actually just like add more code and evaluate more things. I can times it by two. So you see, I can, it's kind of like a REPL, but it is just a buffer. So you don't have to learn any new concepts. As long as you know how to evaluate with Conjure, you can run more stuff in here. 
Um, and this is great because I have really, really poor memory. So when I'm working on a project and I evaluate a few things and I'm like, oh, what was that value again? I go back in here and I look inside my, my log buffer and I'm like, oh, it was, it was like, yeah, it was 60, cool. Yeah, of course, um, which is really, really handy. Uh, we can also do things like I can run this form. So let's print hello world. You get the output come out here. Cool. We know what print hello world does now. You would hope we all do. Um, I can evaluate a function, which just returns a nil. So we've got this function nil. I can call that function. So I can write my call of init and I can do comma ee, -E, and I just ran init. One of the other neat things of using a lisp is that I can do times two here. And by using a certain mapping, I can slurp the form. So I just kind of put that form within the other one. And then if I was like, oh, I don't actually want this outer bit, I can do comma O and I've just popped it out. So there's a lot of really expressive uh, manipulations we can do with Lisps because we're essentially uh, modifying the uh, AST. We're not modifying the text. We're, we have access to the abstract syntax tree. Um, so this is just kind of an overview of kind of the weirdness and benefits of when you're writing Lisps. Uh, the other benefit is that we can do um, macros. So we can define macros. I, I'm not going to show it here because I'll probably get it wrong, but we can define macros that will um, essentially add syntax to the language, um, which I'll touch on when I get to my slides. So without further ado, let's uh, actually add some code. So first thing I want to do is require some more modules. So I'm going to, I'm going to paste this in. I want to require Aniseed core, Aniseed by being my um, standard library for uh, writing these plugins. I wrote a standard library because Lua doesn't have one really. And I wrote all of this tooling to compile Fennel inside Neovim and thought a standard library would be really good. So I'm gonna require that an alias is A. Again, I have a string library. These all work like closures libraries. If you've ever used closure, there's a lot of functions in here that will be familiar. Um, and Envim, which is actually Norcali's Envim.Lua, which is fantastic. And apparently uh, a lot of it is built into Neovim now, but I still use the separate Lua script just because it has a few extra bits that didn't quite make it into uh, Neovim itself. Um, and I get to control this version. I, I like, I get to version control this one. So uh, brought in that require, I can do comma ER, which evaluated the root form. So I evaluated this whole block uh, and I can check the log and I can see what that returned. And this big blob here is a Lua module. Uh, you can see it's a Lua module because you can see the init function here. Um, but then there's all this extra stuff. There's these aniseed slash things. You don't need to worry about those. Please pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Uh, this is aniseed stuff um, that allows me to do funky things such as uh, creating private functions. So let's say we have a private function. I'll evaluate that. Uh, and I call add uh, one, two, we get three. That works. The cool thing about this is if somebody requires this module, if they require kkslider.main, they cannot see add. So only we can see add while we're working within the file. So it allows you to develop private functions without exposing them, uh, which I don't know if you can do that with VimScript. I feel like if you need to access it, you need to make it global. Um, and now I'm gonna move a little faster. So that's kind of all of the overview of why out the way, I hope for now. Let's paste in some code. So the first thing I want to do is to find some state. I'm gonna use my def once macro. That means that if I run the file, so I can do comma EF to load the whole file, uh, it's only going to be defined once, which is useful because I don't want the state to constantly be reset every time I change the code. So that will persist. Let's have a error function. So we've got echo error. I can test this. This is how I test my code. This is how I develop. I'll, I'll put something in. I'll say, did that come out how I expected? Yes. Yes, it did. It came out exactly as I expected. Um, so, oh, I put my wrong tab up. Yeah, so that came out as expected. It put KK slider in front and it printed it. Wonderful. Uh, let's grab another function. So I've got my upsert buff function. This is just going to create my, uh, my slide buffer um, and set some, some key mappings. And as you can see, I'm interacting here with uh, Neovim's uh, remote API. So if you write remote plugins, you'll use the same thing. And if you write Lua plugins, it's the same API. Uh, except it's within the process. So uh, it's a little bit quicker. Um, and I'm just setting up some key mappings to call some more Lua functions. And you can, as you can see, this is probably the, 
the most clunky part about writing Lua plugins is that you have to like write bridges between um, Vim script and X commands and that sort of thing and Lua. So I'm writing like Lua within an X command within Lua. And it's this is the most unintuitive part of writing these plugins, I find. You get your, your head around it fairly quickly. It's not too bad, but it could definitely be a lot easier. Um, and it's probably the thing that is like hardest to get over initially. So I'm going to evaluate this function, comma er. That's all loaded. Um, I'm going to just keep pulling in functions now because I want to show you what it does. So display is going to uh, upset the buffer. So it's going to upset our slide buffer um, and it's going to set the lines of that buffer from the first one to the last one, not being uh, strict with line numbers and it's going to set them to the lines that are passed in. So it's basically replaced the buffer content with these lines. Um, the next function we're going to have is pass slides. The input to this is a ASCII doc file and what it's going to do is hunt for uh, lines that begin with an equal sign, just a single equal sign, because that's a top level um, ASCII doc heading. So an H1 essentially. And it's going to take those H1s and it's going to split them into individual pages. So given a single ASCII doc file, split them into pages by the headings. Um, and then the next little set of functions we have are the functions for swapping between slides. Um, did I get all of them? I did not. Let's get these two as well. Da, da, da. So uh, you've got update slide, which I've just evaluated, uh, and that takes a function. And that function um, can do anything, but in these two definitions of it, we're going to uh, increment on next slide, and we're going to decrement on previous slide. And we can actually see what these functions do. So I can wrap these in parentheses, put 10 in here, and go like, oh, what does increment do? I evaluate that. So a dot inc with a 10 gives me 11. And I can give it to dec as well. Run that. A dot dec gives me 9. OK. And I really love this. Like, I love the fact that I can just like edit my code and quickly just test functions out like within the context of the code. Uh, I don't need to copy and paste it anywhere else. It's all within this one workflow, uh, which I find really, really useful. Uh, some other neat things about this uh, is that if I do this, so I evaluate inc 10, that's actually been put into my register. Uh, you can set which register it goes into. I put it into my default one, but my result of my evaluations go into my register so I can paste in results. And you can also do things like comma e bang, which evaluates it and replaces it with the result. So that's kind of good for like evaluating, uh, I don't know, date expressions or slurping files or uh, yeah, anything you can think of where you might want to run something and put its result inside your buffer. Um, so there's only one more thing we really need to do, two more, I guess. Um, one of them is going to be this function called open slides. This one is going to take a path to a file, load it into memory, pass the slides, and then go to the first slide. And if it failed to load it, it's going to show an error. Uh, so all we need to do is hook a command up to that, and we are good to go. The focus of this isn't the code itself. You don't need to understand all of this. I just wanted to show I'm building it up bit by bit. I'm adding functions. Uh, the first time I developed this, uh, it was a lot more iterative because I didn't know where I was going. I was exploring the solution, but it took me a lot longer to work that out. Uh, if I'm copying from a solution that already exists, you don't get to see kind of the exploration I went through. I went through like four or five different uh, avenues of doing this. And the whole time I was reusing functions, redefining them, uh, getting the output, checking the data. Like when I was writing uh, past slides, like this, I was just running over and over and over again, uh, like doing something like this, where I wrap it in a do and do past slides and do say like, this is a heading and let's do backslash n, uh, backslash n, foo, backslash n. Uh, this is really hard writing uh, a bunch of new lines in here and another. And then if I run that, okay, so I did comma er, that evaluated this whole thing, which meant it reloaded the past slides function and ran it with this input. And then I can have a look at this. Let's put it down here. And you can see the output is a list of two items, because there's one here and one here. And those items contain, uh, this is a heading with foo and another with bar. 
So that's a good way of just like iterating on a function, giving it a single input, change the function, hit one mapping, your cursor doesn't move, but you see the result, whether it was an error, whether it was what you wanted to see, I might be trying to refactor it to get rid of like this extra like quote here, I could be doing some trimming to get rid of it. And that iterative behavior is so fast. Uh, see that, that's fantastic for development. And now I wanna get rid of this code, right? I just wanna put this at the top level again. So I hit comma O and then equals equals indents. So it's like, in, it's very vimish, like a very low amount of key presses can get you a lot of results. You just have to know what you're going for. And there's a learning curve to these things. Um, so I would expect people to be like, what on earth is going on? How is this happening sometimes? So I'm gonna do comma EF and load the file because this is my final code. I know that this is correct. Um, this hasn't been run yet because the init function was called when I opened NeoVim. So I'm gonna run this form which will define the command. So comma EE, -E, that loaded the command. And now I can do KK slider and point it at my slides file. And we have a slideshow. Yay, it didn't break, which is fantastic. Um, I promise that's all the uh, weird evaluations I will subject you to for now, uh, except at the end, I will show you how to do it yourself with uh, the Conjure School. Um, so First of all, the status quo, because I've developed a lot of Vim plugins uh, in VimScript, and I've developed quite a few now in Fennel and Aniseed, um, including Conjure itself. So that, that log that was popping up and all those things, that is all written in Fennel compiled to Lua. Um, so what options do we have? Uh, when we are we're interactively developing uh, VimScript, we can change our Vimmel and we can restart NeoVim. That is a very surefire way of getting the changes in. It's not um, particularly dynamic. It doesn't keep your state and all that sort of thing, but it will get the changes in. Uh, we could evaluate the entire file that you're working on. So if you're working on a VimScript plugin, you could say load the file, load the file, load the file every time you change something. Uh, again, it's it's okay, um, but it's low fidelity. It's You can't say evaluate this one small thing. Um, you have to do everything at once and you might need to wrap some code in if statements to say, I don't want this to run twice. If it runs twice, bad things will happen. Um, you don't want to run fire the missiles twice. You like That's only meant to happen once on file load. Um, our alternative then, if we want to be more specific, is to use uh, the X commands and say, I want to run this individual piece of VimScript, which is okay, uh, but you end up having to like write things out twice or copy and paste them between the buffer and the uh, command prompt. Um, you then have to copy the results out and paste those back into your buffer. And the flow is kind of like, it's split, right? You, you have your source and you have your evaluations um, and you have your results, but they're not um, homogenous. They're not tied together, which is something that I tried to do with Conjure. I tried to make it so that the input is in the buffer and the result is in the buffer and they are one and the same. They are indistinguishable, uh, which is very Lisp-like. Code and data, data is code, if you've ever heard that sort of uh, silly phrase. Um, so the other, the other kind of thing that I'm not a massive fan of about the uh, status quo is that it's VimScript and I'm just not smart enough to write good, clever, interesting things with it. I trip up on the syntax. I get caught on things. Um, I know you can do great things with it. I have used so many amazing plugins, like uh, all the stuff that T Pope uh, throws out there is just amazing. But I don't think I'm good enough to do those things. I need something a bit uh, simpler and easier for my brain to comprehend. Um, and I quite like this quote from Local Tog on Reddit. Um, I would say that Vimal is like the PHP of editor scripting languages. It's by no means a useless language, but the more you work with it, the more you find yourself fighting against the countless quirks of the language. Um, so it, it's perfectly usable. People make amazing things with it, but I think we can do better, or at least I want to use something that I consider better. Um, again, subjective. Um, it's purely my opinions based on my experience and what languages I've written and what problems I've faced. So. All those tools I just showed you. What are they and what do they give us? So I was showing you Conjure, which is the UX, kind of the, the mappings and the log and the, the behavior, what you can see, um, and Aniseed, which is a uh, bridge between Fennel, the language that compiles to Lua, uh, and NeoVim. It creates that, uh, it does the glue part for you. So rather than just a generic Lua language, it's geared towards helping you do things in NeoVim. Um, so Fennel, will give us uh, macros, so we can create new syntax on the fly. Um, that's what the, the module um, syntax and defn and def once, all of those are macros I wrote. They don't exist in Lua, they don't exist in Fennel. I made those up. Um, so they are part of Aniseed syntax that it adds to the language. Um, 
the other things we get are structural editing, as I showed. I can do like comma O and it will pop a form out. So I can just kind of throw away the outside. Um, there's some really clever things you can do there, like convolution will swap an if and a let and put the if outside the let. Um, so there's all sorts of clever things you can do that you learn over time. Again, like Vim, it's a learning curve. You don't learn it all in one day. You pick these up things up over years of like using lisps and things. Um, it's a really consistent syntax. Like there's not much to it. There's no, oh, but in this case, if statements look like this and loops look like this, they are all a parentheses with something at the front and things after it. That's it. Um, and it feels like closure. So if you like closure, it could be really good for you. Um, I am a massive fan. So for me, it was a really good fit. Um, we get to use Lua's speed without having to touch it. Not that Lua's bad. Um, it's it's very simple. There's not much wrong with it. Uh, there's nothing you can really pick holes in it. It's just fast and simple. Um, and it's fantastic that we get to use that while having um, a flexible syntax on top. Um, so when you're using Aniseed as well, you get this bridge, as I said, between NeoVim and Fennel. So you don't have to worry about a bunch of things. You get a closure-like standard library to an extent. It's very small, but I give you things like map and filter, which don't exist in Lua by default. Um, but I've implemented those uh, on top of Lua. Uh, through Fennel, so you can lean on all of those when you use Aniseed. Uh, and you get a built-in test suite, which I didn't show, but uh, every Aniseed plugin um, has a test suite built in. So you can run, if you run my repo setup script, you can do that and right away run make test. And that will uh, compile any Fennel that needs to be compiled, open NeoVim, run all of your tests that are auto-discovered, uh, collect the results and print them out as text uh, to the to standard out uh, and return the correct exit code. So this works in CI out of the box. You can just start adding tests. You can just keep going and adding more and more and more. And you can uh, create buffers and swap buffers and insert text and make sure it behaves correctly. Like it's kind of opinionated, but it's good that it just it just works out of the box. It's there for you. You don't need to make a decision about how am I going to test this thing. I tried to do that for you, um, and hopefully I did it justice. Uh, and then when you're using Conjure, which is the, the UX side, uh, you get evaluation uh, down to individual symbols. So what is in this variable? I can say comma EW, and it evaluates the word under my cursor, um, all the way up to forms, which is just a block of code, uh, buffers, so the whole buffer in memory, files from disk, um, and there's other things such as uh, I can set a mark. So I could set a mark to MF on a form, and I can go elsewhere in my project, and I can say, run that mark. And without my cursor, my cursor won't move, my buffer won't change, but Conjure will go and find that form in that buffer, load that code and run it, which is fantastic. If you're writing a web server or something and you're testing like something that keeps requesting it, you can have your request in some other file. You can go and work on your web server and say, hey, uh, that thing that I told you about earlier, can you run that again for me? And it will go and run that for you, uh, which I found really, really useful. Um, we toyed with calling it the spellbook as well, but maybe that's a bit too cheesy. Uh, so yeah, when you use Conjure, you get uh, support for Aniseed and Fennel, Janet and Clojure with a consistent UX. More languages coming in the future. So as I said, I want common Lisp and Scheme soon. So more Lisps, um, but I want non-Lisps as well. I want to support uh, uh, JavaScript and Python. And this kind of depends on TreeSitter uh, landing in NeoVim. I'm holding out for that. I'm really excited for it because it will allow me to say comma EE is actually uh, the block of Python code under your cursor. And then I could easily pull that Python code out and send it off for evaluation. So you could have the same sort of like interactive, hey, run the thing under my cursor, um, but in non-Lisp languages. I chose Lisps just because I love them and because it's easy to write stuff that pulls out bits of code because it's clearly indicated by these parentheses. Whereas other languages, you need to pass the AST from the beginning um, lisps you can kind of just pass from the point your cursor is at, if that makes sense. Um, so my other reasoning for this, I guess my final reasoning uh, for choosing these things in a very subjective way, I think it's the better language. I prefer using Lua and Fennel to VimScript. I'm sure people could argue the other way and that's perfectly fine just for me. That's what works. Um, you get really fast runtime. You get Lua JIT performance, which you can't really beat that unless you're writing C near enough. Um, and you get a minuscule feedback loop. So you get this kind of this conversation going where you send a request, you get a response. You can use that response to send the next request. And you can do this interactively with no delay inside one buffer. 
So you barely have to move your cursor. It's a REPL, but it's integrated within your text editor and your registers um, and your, your text editing experience. You don't go to another terminal and open a REPL where the editing experience is like, I can go to the beginning and the end of the line, but I don't know any other keys. When you're doing it this way, you have your full Vim knowledge to edit the code and the result of that evaluation and then send it off for more evaluations, uh, which is really good for exploring data. Sometimes I'll dump like a few thousand uh, records of something from some closure data, and then I will start to manipulate that. I'll then filter that down. And I'm kind of doing iterative queries on text inside my buffer. So on the on the subject of conversing with the computer, uh, there is this this tweet I saw the other day from Dragon on Twitter, uh, who is writing some really interesting closure books about machine learning from scratch. Um, which yeah, I really I really want to look at those. I just don't have time. Um, so uh, I never perfectly understand the problem while I'm solving it. My code materializes my understanding, so it's never perfect either. As my understanding improves, the code follows it. For me, it's important that the programming language supports that fluidity. And I would argue that that should extend to your text editor and your tooling as well. You should have a complete iterative and fluid conversation with your language and your language should be uh, able to support, like be malleable enough to support your exploration. Um, so your language, your tools and your brain should be in a constant conversation. It should be one loop where the state is never reset. The program's never turned off and on. It's always going and you are constantly poking and manipulating the state. You are like in the computer poking the processor and going, hey, do the thing. I want to see what it does. Um, you're not stepping out of the process and saying, hey, let's start from the beginning again, and I hope I get it right this time. Um, a note on kind of ubiquity, because I've shown all these, these weird things and I've talked about closure and common lisp and these languages that you assumed died about 20 years ago. Uh, and I, I got a comment on the fact that you can use this for anything. So yes, I write all my plugins with Aniseed and Fennel, and they end up being Lua plugins. To my end users, they don't know about Fennel. They just get given Lua and it loads the Lua. They never see the Fennel. It's purely for my own development. Um, so that's fantastic. I love that. It's Lua at rest. And I made that conscious decision that you compile it to Lua ahead of time and you ship Lua. And then anything that goes wrong in the Fennel land, the user never sees it. They never encounter that complexity. Um, my dot files, my NeoVim config, is entirely Fennel as well. There is a single, no, there is one Vim file uh, which uh, basically just sets up my plugins and calls uh, aniseed.dotfiles. It loads that module. Once you do that, uh, you essentially get first class Fennel based configuration for your NeoVim. So you add this one line to your init.vim after your plugin manager loads. Uh, and then it will look inside the FNL directory. It will find Fennel files. It will compile them to Lua as and when they change. And then it will load that Lua as you open NeoVim. So I have no, I basically have zero Vim script that I've written on my hard drive. Like it's all Fennel compiled to Lua transparently now. Um, so you can go and have a look if you want. You can see what my dot files, which are kind of extensive, look like written in this Lisp. Um, and I've also uh, written a plugin called uh, MVim Local Fennel, which uses Aniseed uh, to do what Vim Local VimRC does, which is a mouthful. Um, so it will compile uh, local files up your directory tree uh, from Fennel to Lua and evaluate that Lua. And again, only if the Fennel changes. So you get the Lua performance with no overhead of Fennel as long as you're not changing the file. So you can write Fennel, get Lua configuration or Lua based configuration. Um, and yeah, so you could use it for basically anything. Um, you just end up with like one line of Vim script here and there that says, hey, load my thing for me. Um, and that may go away at some point if like NeoVim swaps to fully first class um, Lua, we could be uh, we could be getting away from that entirely and just saying, well, my init.lua is loaded by default. So I can just put some Lua there and forget about everything else, which will be fun. Um, and other people in the conference have talked about speed. So Lua is fast. We know it's fast by now. Uh, this question on Quora, why is Lua so fast, uh, is about um, implementing Munchausen numbers, which I don't know what they are, but I looked at the algorithm um, and it scared me. I didn't sleep for a week. Uh, so it's pretty complex and I guess it's, it's very specific. So take it with a massive pinch of salt. Um, but Lua is one second away from C. Uh, in this benchmark, um, which I'm sure there's loads of others where it's miles away, but 
uh, yeah, Luajit is pretty darn fast. And uh, as other people have mentioned, Vim9 has some things coming through that might make it faster. They do require breaking changes to VimScript though. So if you want the improvements, they won't work with NeoVim or with the older versions of Vim. So you could only use them in the latest version of Vim, which is trade-offs, right? Sometimes you got to do that. Um, yeah, there's some kind of positives for Vim is that, or Vim, VimScript, Vim all, is that it is a DSL. So with very few words, you can do a lot. You can describe what you want to do to Vim very concisely, which is fantastic. Um, we can kind of get that with Fennel by just writing macros, though, right? So we can have the benefits of Lua being hyper-minimal and fast, really fast. Um, but we can add macros. Uh, so kind of to do these uh, NeoVim or Vim-specific things. So if you think of uh, Noah Kali's uh, mvim.lua, which helps you interface with uh, NeoVim from Lua, what if we wrote one of those in Fennel that did it all through macros instead of Lua's uh, meta tables? then we could have even more interesting specific syntax. We could implement command bang, like command exclamation mark and auto commands and that sort of thing as first class pieces of the language. Um, it would just take a bit of effort to write them all. Um, so yeah, uh, closing on, on the kind of language choice and the differences between VimScript and, and uh, Lua is just that LuaJIT is a marvel of engineering. It's just incredible and I'm so glad we get to use it. Uh, Lua is so small <laughs> that it's hard to find fault in it. It's fast and it's simple. That's about it. What you do with it and what you build on top of it is up to you. And I feel like Fennel lets us extend Lua in ways that you couldn't normally do. Uh, it's more than meta tables. It's syntax that we can add, which is uh, pretty fun when you when you get used to it and when you start experimenting with it. So now, um, I don't know how much time I have left. I think I've probably got like 10, 10 15 minutes. Um, but I would like to take you all to school. Uh, so... Yes, uh, as Primager mentioned, it is running a script from the internet and it's totally, totally safe and I'm not going to steal your Bitcoin wallets. So please do uh, just look at the script first uh, if you want to um, have a little look. Um, but basically what I would like some people to do, if you'd like to, is try out uh, the school, which will drop you into a... It will download Kunja into your temp directory. It will launch NeoVim with Kunja running um, and it will let you interactively learn Kunja's uh, mappings while evaluating Fennel within your NeoVim. Uh, so I actually have Kunja installed, so I can run it here. And I can show a few of the commands. So let's go and run the Kunja school. This is what you'll get if you run that curl command. Um, it has a bunch of spiel about like what keys to press and what your configuration is. If you have a local leader set, because all of Kunja's prefixes by default are on local leader. Um, but you can you can set that to whatever you want. And if you don't have one set, it will set it to comma for the purposes of the school. Uh, but I can do comma EB, evaluate the buffer, and it congratulates me. Thank you very much, school. That's great. Uh, and it tells you all about the log. So I can open up the log. Fantastic. And I can go into this form and I can evaluate the form. I don't want to spoil it too much. Just have a read in your own time, maybe, and go through this. I'd love to hear your feedback of that. Um, it's, yeah, pretty, pretty simple. Um, but it will show you all of the mappings you can do near enough with Kunja. Um, and if you're interested in that, then you could then look at using it with Janet or with Clojure. So if you're interested in learning some Clojure, you could use this if you want. Uh, so you can just use NeoVim and have my, kind of all of my opinions and my years of work on what uh, NeoVim plus Clojure UX should be, because I've been working on this for about four or five years now. Uh, I've, I've gone through like four iterations where one of them was written in Clojure, talking to NeoVim over a remote RPC connection. Um, so that was, yeah, that was fun to do, but eventually I've, I've moved and progressed over years and years of rewrites. And now I've come to this where I'm writing uh, a Lisp inside NeoVim and running it as Lua. Um, and this is kind of the the local maximum I've stumbled across for creating complex Vim plugins. Um, I've tried so many approaches and this has been the best bug-free, fastest development experience I've like got to after literally four or five years of rewriting over and over again. Um, so I'm kind of, yeah, I, I'm basically at the end here. I had an extra like 10, 15 minutes on top of my original time. Uh, I'd love to take some questions if anyone has them, um, just because this is all weird. Like this is very niche and new and uh, uh, I don't expect everyone to have written Fennel or, or Clojure or anything like that. So uh, 
yeah, I, I don't know how how we can do some questions or something like that if we still have time. Because um, I think I still have maybe like another 10 minutes. Mm. Let me just see. Ah, questions reposting here. Oh, excellent. Thank you, Adam. Support for Emacs Lisp. Ah, this is actually like this was me trying to get uh, a Lispy Lispy behavior within NeoVim, but not so much uh, Emacs Lisp because Emacs Lisp is a bit dated compared to what I do with Fennel. Fennel is more close to closure. Um, so, what are these questions? Um, when do your dot .file fennels get compiled? Is it on startup? So is it fast? Uh, hi Dave, nice to see you. Um, so uh, it's compiled on startup, but only if it's changed. So it's only compiled once. So my dot .files, I can actually, let's go into my dot .files, shall we? Oop, if I can type. Uh, .config, nope, yep, nix packages, in a vim. So these are my dot .files. And this is the only Vim script in my dot .files. So you got all these plugins and everything. That line loads all of the fennel and it's compiled ahead of time into Lua and only once until I change it. And I can go into this fennel directory. So you got init.vim, you got fennel, dot .files, init.fennel. This is the entry point. Now everything is fennel from here on down. Um, I'm gonna try and keep up the questions. Uh, bu, bu, bu. So yes, it's fast. It's just loading loading Lua from disk. Um, is the log buffer a buffer in terminal mode? No, it is not. It is just a regular buffer. Um, so when I when I have this buffer open, is this going to work? Yeah, this is a regular buffer. It's not a terminal buffer. But I will be adding. Um, there's a mode that's coming through NeoVim in one of the next versions, which means that if you type like plus ten, twenty, whatever, and hit enter here it will actually evaluate it. So it kind of behaves like a terminal and I will be adding that as an option when that's when that's through. Um, I hope that answers your question. How do you keep track of parentheses without any coloring? Uh, well, actually all list programmers get a module inserted in their brain that allows them to see parentheses with color. So actually I can see it. Um, yeah, uh, I just got used to it. So you don't worry about it after a while. Like I think when you first see lists, you go, how do you keep track of all these? Like, how do you, how do you know which one is which? I don't, and I don't care. It's not a problem. Like, if I'm interested in what parentheses I'm on, can you see here, it shows me which one is which, and I can do percent to jump between them. So I can go inside this function and put it there. Like, I, I can see which parentheses I'm on, and that's all the information I really need to know. Um, yeah, it's, it's just, I can see which one matches up, and I can hop into the one I'm interested in. And if I want to pop something out, I could be like, well, I just want this function, so DAF. Now it's down here. It's so easy to manipulate these structures that I don't worry about the parentheses so much. Uh, do your workflows work as well when you work with common Lisp or other Lisp variants? Yes. So if I can show repos or Gunja, uh, I'll try and be as fast as I can because I'd want to get to as many questions as I can. Uh, dot slash dev. Let's start up a closure REPL and open up sandbox.cojc. I'm now in a closure namespace. And here you go, that's closure. That's connected, it just connected straight away. I can run the tests, I can do, it actually like prints correctly with new lines and things. So you can animate things as it would print in the terminal. It took me so long to get that to work correctly. So the outputs and the new lines are all respected as they should be. Um, so there's all sorts, of, all sorts of fun things in there, but yes, closure and fennel and aniseed all have the exact same UX and uh, common Lisp will have the same uh, support as well. And things like um, autocompletion. So you get autocompletion. These will work out of the box. And if I had common Lisp support, they all work out of the box, which is pretty fun. Um, log buffer is a buffer. Uh, parentheses works with common Lisp. Um, What's the Lua equivalent for all the kinds of functions which are specified to text editing and not general purpose functions? So by that, I think you mean like the Vim access thing. So Chris Heitoff, um, basically all of these functions in here, if you do H API in NeoVim, uh, you get all of these functions. So buff get mark. So all these things that interact with NeoVim, 
you can access all of these. And you can also do, um, let's get back to another buffer. Uh, basically, you can you can access everything you can from uh, um, from VimScript in. So I can do like mvim.bo.wrap dot uh, wrap if I type it right. Oh, wo wo. So I can access like every um, Vim script thing from within Fennel. Like they are all accessible. Some ways are more direct and first class than others, uh, but you can just access like FN. Anything in here now is any Vim script function you can think of. So get PID is the same as echo get PID. Three two three two two three two three two two. So you can access all these functions and things uh, very easily. Um, I'm trying to I'm trying to keep track of questions. Um, so yes, you can access everything uh, everything text editing specific. It's all there. Uh, the dot fnl extension is fennel. So uh, if you search fennel language on GitHub or whatever, um, yeah, you will find everything to do with fennel the language. It's completely separate to uh, yeah, there you go, Fennel Lang. I can see the link for that now. Uh, prompt already exists in head, if you're wondering. Yes, the prompt would be cool to have. I was just waiting for it to release, but I need to experiment with it. Uh, any other questions? I'm scrolling down. I'm trying to catch up. Maybe I'm getting kicked off. Da, da, da. Do you use Parinfo, Paradit, or something like that? I use uh, Vim uh, S expression, Vim sex P. Um, so this one. What a fancy logo. I use VimsXP with uh, tpopes uh, VimsXP mappings for regular people, which is the name of the repository. It's very catchy. And I use those two, and that allows me to uh, slurp and buff forms nicely. Uh, color scheme I'm using. Uh, this is uh, sorcery, it's called, um, which is apt considering Conjure and all the wizard based names. Um, but yeah, S-R-C-E-R-Y, I think it's called. And I use it for my terminal. I use it for basically everything. And that's what gives you that nice, this nice pink color as well, is all sorcery colors. Um, I'm sure it's very similar to other themes, but sorcery is fantastic. I really like it. Um, but yeah, I haven't really used Parinfer uh, for people that are interested in Lisps and stuff. Parinfer looks cool. There's a Rust plugin uh, for it that uh, is really, really fast, um, but it does things to my file that I don't enjoy. I prefer being a bit more intentful and saying, I want to slurp this to here. I would rather tell Vim what I want it to do and it not infer it, uh, just because sometimes it doesn't do what I want. So yeah, I use I use VimsXP for that. Um, or SXP is how it should be pronounced. Not very catchy, but um, I feel like that's probably it, unless there's any more questions. Uh, do they run in async? Um, yes. If you're talking about closure, uh, when you're writing closure with Conjure, uh, it is fully asynchronous. Um, it will let you run things and disappear and go to other stuff. All of the auto-completion is fully asynchronous. Um, so it never blocks NeoVim. Everything inside Conjure tries to be asynchronous. Um, the aniseed part isn't because it's running within NeoVim's process. So there is only one process. We can't do two things at once in one process. Um, the Janet support is async. You're live. I guess I should hop off. Um, thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>